Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery, and today I'm excited to have Shankar Ganapati, who's the founder of Boomerang, uh, a company which looks at generating pipeline by monitoring customer job changes, getting warm intros from advocates, and automating the next steps. A big thanks to Satesh Sirur for an introduction. Welcome to the show, Shankar. Hey, thank you. Glad to be here, and hi everyone. Awesome. So, uh, so you know, you, you had a interesting journey. Um, you know, before the call, we discussed that you you were with Mind Tickle, uh, pre pre revenue. Uh, you you started off in marketing and then you got into sales. I think that's a, that's a pretty unique, uh, career move. What got you interested to move into a sales role uh, as an account executive in Mind Tickle? Yeah. So, uh. You know, part of the journey at Mindical was, you know, when you are early on in the company, uh, you pretty much get to wear multiple hats. And uh, in the zero to one journey, I was partnering closely with uh, one of the founders in helping really figure out who is our ICP, what's our messaging, and uh, how do we get, you know, you know, make sure we win our our right our share of deals. And uh, as we grow to the next stage. I also moved from India to US as part of the team uh, that was helping set up the uh, US company. And the uh, being in marketing, the lure was how can you perfect the, uh, have the perfect message? How can you have the perfect talk track? How can you have the perfect playbook? And you know, more often than not, I would also, being an early stage startup, I also had the chance to go run some of the sales cycles. And that was super exciting because you get to test out the message real time. You get to re understand what the buyers really need. And uh, one thing led to the other. And uh, one of the founders said, hey, you seem to be doing well in sales. Why don't you go to sales? And the company also needed someone who could take care of some of the early uh, marquee logos, especially on the enterprise side. And uh, and it was, again, for me as well, you know, you know, I wanted to go learn sales uh, before I start my own startup. And the part of the lure was, you know, I knew the product quite well. I, I obviously knew a lot of the customers that I'm going to work with. Uh, and uh, can I make this happen? So spend the next three, four years over there uh, selling and more importantly, uh, learning how to sell uh, in the journey. Interesting because, you know, I've always been a sales guy where I, I knew a bit about marketing, which is especially content marketing. And you know, I've done a bit of podcasts and webinars, but I'm no expert in marketing, you know. But what... What were you know some some of the skill sets that you had to add in order to move from marketing to sales? Like somebody if wants to move into a totally different um you know you know department and skill set, what did you need to learn uh in order to do so well in sales? Uh, yeah, I mean uh, these are two different jobs. I mean when I was running marketing, uh, obviously. You know, a lot of the focus was, you know, dig things on digital, things like events, uh, customer uh, advocacy groups. Right? It's mostly one-to-end kind of an approach where you take, you do one thing and how do you get n, n number of people to be attracted towards that one thing. Uh, and uh, but I think that the difference when it moved to sales was a lot about what does one-to-end -one communication look like? What does one-to-one -one personalization look like? And you cannot have a generic message and a generic playbook uh, uh, to, to in order to do that. Uh, so that was a big change, right? Where again, when I go into a discovery call, you know, being able to understand what specifically that customer wants to solve, having that empathy that hey, this customer is looking to get to a better future, right? And in marketing, you don't necessarily care about individual customers. While you do philosophically, in practice, you care about groups of customers, groups of prospects, right? And that was a big change. And along with that, obviously, the way in which you communicate, uh, and I had to really evolve. Uh, I was coming from a different background, a uh, different accent. Uh, you know, in India, I'm used to speaking fast, right? And I had to really slow things down. And also, you know, selling a tech product to a more traditional industry meant that being able to adapt to multi multiple cultures, uh, you know, that was interesting. And again, uh, being able to be present in the moment, you know, those are some things that you obviously need more generally as well, but more so in sales. Uh, is that, Those are some of the things I have to pick up uh, as I move, switch over to sales. Yeah, 
You know, absolutely, Shankar. I think I need to take it offline with you on how to speak slower because that's that's a constant feedback that I'm getting. That I speak fast, um, as an Indian. But uh, but I had uh, you know Anupam Rastogi from Emergent uh, Ventures, um, who who talked about how you know a lot of Indian SaaS companies, uh, are able to you know build the markets from, uh, from uh, especially the teams from India, and then acquire customers fr from the US. Uh, again, wanted to you know talk about your experience in mind mind tickle where you were building uh, a, a, you know a, you were based in India. Uh, what what advice you would give to founders who are looking to you know uh, get to product market fit in India and then move to a much bigger market to uh, in the US? Any advice for for young founders who would want to uh, you know go to the US later on? Uh, and build teams launch. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're going through the journey ourselves here in my new startup, right? And I think part of uh, our learning and every company is different. I have friends who've cracked, you know, zero, 10 mil uh, journey with pretty much no presence in the US. Mm. Uh, in our journey at Mindtickle, you know, we wanted to go up market very early in the journey. Uh, so one of the founders had actually moved to the US and then uh, we also had hired the first set of salespeople uh, in the US uh, very early in the journey, right? And yes. very atypical for a company coming out of India, yeah. uh, where you tend to hire a lot more people in India and then eventually in the US. But then uh, I think the way we made it work was, you know, pretty much looking at uh, GTM to be US first and uh, product engineering and R&D to be uh, India first, right? And any obviously uh, uh, subordinate functions were obviously based on the right combination of cost and efficiency um so if you're an india india based you know entrepreneur i think the two questions to answer for yourself is what market are you primarily selling in the long term or at least the medium term if you are going to sell in the us market and even in the us uh, more you know up market you know commercial enterprise segment uh, you should consider having a field presence either by moving yourself here or having having someone that you trust here uh, or if you're obviously selling a lot of SMB mid-market type deals, a lot of that can be done remotely. Enough entrepreneurs have done that, uh, you know, from India, from, in fact, not just India, anywhere else in the world. So again, what market are you selling into and what segment are you selling to? That's one question. And a second question is really what type of company you want to really build, right? And again, uh, a lot of a lot of companies, like if you take, Mindtickle as an example, Mindtickle obviously wanted to build a product first company. So a lot of the core product, at least back in the day, we built in India and uh, that's how we scaled the company. Whereas there are other startups, uh, you know, where you go where the talent is. Like, I, I know you, you'll hire your product people in the US because this, they have a lot more exposure to B2B SaaS products and how, how it can scale. So those are two questions that really one needs to answer. Again, in our own journey at Boomerang, uh, you know, we are obviously looking at what does it take to deliver the right value to the market that we have chosen to go after. And obviously, we are taking advantage of the fact that we've got a strong person in India. But then we are being very open about, uh, you know, all the possibilities and making sure that we are doing it, doing just to the customers. That's gen that's typically what at least we've seen at uh, our journey. Got it. And, you know, you, you were part of Mindicle and Huntshire and then... Uh, what made you start buyer assist and then you pivoted to uh, a boomerang? You know what? What were some of the pain points that want, you wanted to address then? Yeah, so Hamsha uh, was my first attempt at doing a startup. Uh, this was obviously a twenty-two year old kid back in twenty twelve uh, in India. Right. Uh, before uh, you know, even the word SaaS, something I know, even the word called SaaS, and. Uh, you know, we were obviously at that time selling in Indian market, uh, struggled selling in Indian market back in the day. So we, uh, I shut, shut that down and I joined Mindtickle at that time in 20, around 2014, right? And uh, the six years at Mindtickle was a lot of foundational learning on what is sales, what is sales enablement, uh, really thinking about what is the future of sales? What are some of the big investments uh, that companies have to make in order to continue to sell and service customers in the future? And uh, the thesis 
at viruses and boomerang for that matter uh, is very central to the the movement towards buyer centric selling uh, and if you think about uh, the evolution of sales uh, you know especially in the last 5 to 7 5 to 7 years uh, we've seen crazy amount of technology uh, being built uh, for every aspect of seller you know from you know how you enable sales teams to how do you drive help them be more productive and effective to how do you even drive revenue accountability from sales teams but what's also happened in the in parallel is you know buyers have gotten smarter buyers are able to hide from sales people and get information about products uh, you know in, in dark social and uh, the, the thesis for and the buyer assist, uh, uh, is about the concept called buyer enablement uh, and the idea that if you enable your buyers to buy from you uh, they will buy from you again 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 and again and uh, that's where we started buyer assist and i think boomerang was a natural evolution in the journey uh, you know part of being a startup and especially a venture back startup uh, our uh, the, the accountability that we have to investors is going find and finding product market fit uh, in markets that can really scale markets in problems that you know wider cross sectional market needs uh, and which can obviously uh, mean a much bigger tam and much bigger opportunity uh, so boomerang really started as a feature uh, in buyer assist but then we quickly realized this had much more demand uh, you know amongst our customers and also it was servicing our larger vision on how do you enable your buyers to buy from you and uh, that's where we pivoted to boomerang and i think we've seen some uh, great impact that we were able to create for our customers uh, the last few months got it and you know before the call you you, you mentioned you, you've been successful to uh, work with customers like um like navar and consensus which are scaling fast in you know helping them grow uh, the annual revenues so i'm just wondering you know how how do you look at getting your first 5 to 10 customers what were uh what are some of the strategies that you looked at to to get your you know first set of customers yeah again uh, it goes back to the uh, you know same thesis what kind of what's your construct for the first million dollars or the first 10 million dollars uh do you want to get 1000 dollar deals do you want to get 10000 dollar deals do you want to get 100000 dollar deals or do you want to get a million dollar deals uh and uh, and then obviously you have to make sure the problem you are solving is relevant in the right segment so that's the first thing right but then that alone is not sufficient so the way we looked at the market is you want to go after mid size companies uh, that are capable of paying in six figures uh, 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 eventually and we want to go make a you know uh, uh, make a dent in that so that's how we picked this market and uh, in that market obviously the first set of customers is all about who do you know who can uh, put in touch with someone that you know right and uh, a lot of these customers were actually customers that we worked closely uh, uh, with uh, buyer assist and we've delivered value for them and then obviously we're also working with them uh, with a new product right and uh, and again the, the beauty here is because with boomerang we are able to deliver immediate pipeline impact uh, they are also able to test it out very quickly and also make this part of the tech stack so that they as, as they look to scale their pipe gen efforts so again looking at uh, it's really about the first set of customers are are, are hand raises uh, they are rarely cold uh, uh, and if they are cold they have to it takes much longer sales cycles to uh, convince them to uh, be on board but then the first set of customers are, are also you know when you are taking the bet so you have to find a way to get you know someone to you know help you find those people you know, from a network that's at least how we found the first set of customers got it and uh, and you know um i've been part of very early stage startups that have helped in building sales playbooks but how would you define a sales playbook and 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 should uh, the founder build the sales playbook or should the head of sales build the playbook yeah so again interesting question right again uh, i'll go back to my journey at mindtical right where I, i went through i think four phases if i may like from founder led playbook to a, a more traditional uh, you know or a first time vp sales uh, playbook to a season vp sales to ultimately like a cro led uh, playbook uh, 
I think a lot of the question is depend on the stage. Uh, early on in the first $5 million journey, uh, there is nothing called a sales playbook. There is some, there's only thing called a revenue playbook because the difference between marketing, sales, customer success uh, is not significant, right? You want to talk to your customers uh, very consistently. Uh, you want to be able to understand why are they talking to you? Why are they buying from you? Why are they using their product? So that's where a founder-led playbook is super critical because founder is connecting the dots all the way from you know the ad copy to the renewal uh, 12 months later or 18 months later. Uh, but as you get to the point where you defined product market fit, uh, you know you can afford to split you know go to market into marketing, sales, customer success. And that is where a sales playbook becomes, uh, you know, critical. And then uh, you are looking at, can I repeat what you have done in the last 12 months? If you've got 25, 30, 40 customers last 12 months, can I double that next, next, uh, in the next year or the next quarter, depending on how you define your goals? And that is where the playbook sort of comes in. The first playbook is almost always uh, made up because you still don't have enough evidence, uh, you know, to support the decisions you're taking. But then a uh, Early on, you're going from the founder-driven playbook to the first playbook where you're looking at the right combination of what's my, how much people, how many people do I need? Uh, you know, what's my coverage model, high-level coverage model? And, uh, and, then, and then what's my high-level sales process? And what are my gates in my sales process? Uh, that further, as you go to the next stage, you sort of figured out not one PMF, but three, four, five different PMF motions. You found and PMF motions could be based on product, based on region, based on segment. And now is when a more seasoned sales leader comes in and they look at things very differently. They, they look at, you know, how do I get $20 million in the next 12 months? Right? How do I retain my $20 million in the next 12 months? And uh, there, the sales playbook combines you know, the right upsells, cross-sells, renewals, new market entry. It's a whole different ballgame. Uh, it requires understanding of, uh, you, know, you know, not just in first, first principle thinking, but understanding of how business work, how, you know, different regions buy, how different types of companies buy, different segments buy. And that is where playbooks evolve to a very different beast. Uh, and uh, that's where a CRO and the right set of VPs can really help you scale uh, go to market differently but again early on the journey you should not even think about any of those problems you should really think about what does it take to you know get my first uh two to five million dollar revenue uh because that's really what you the first game of the first pop, type of customer that you're repeating uh, you, know, you know a few times got it and i just wanted to follow up um uh, and you know suppose you you you're there in a two to five million dollar um a, a era mark um uh, what should be the the profile for the first few sales hires, and you know when when is the right time for the founder to make this sales hire? Do you think, um, uh, you know the the first two 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 to five million dollar mark is when the founder should look for sales hires? Yeah, again, uh, we are going through the journey ourselves here to figure out uh, what's the right uh, time to hire. Yeah. Again, it really depends on uh, the founder profile, the market that you're selling to, uh, and, uh, and and that determines whether you want a sales hire or not. Uh, but you still, the job of a founder early on, at least the way I, you know, we understand is that it's how do you eliminate you continuously, right? And you want to get to a point where system works without, without you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, everything, everything that is external facing, is the most complicated systems where you can't you can't replace yourself because a lot of the early customers aren't buying the product they're buying you mm. uh, and if you can get to the point where you are they're buying the product uh, and you got you figured out the story around the product and the roadmap uh, then you are able to go get someone who can take that message take that product take the uh, icp definition and go replicate that uh, but again, it depends. Some, you know, I've found, I've spoken to other entrepreneurs who do it very early, even though they are first time entrepreneurs, they are able to, even after they get five, 10 customers, they're able to go figure out, hey, this is my story, this is my playbook. And they can go hire salespeople and replicate that. Uh, that's something I'm also trying to learn. Uh, but again, you have to figure out, 
again, your combination of market, uh, your combination of your skill set, and do you really know what is uh, you know what product you are selling? Hmm. Correct. And uh, want want to talk more about uh, you know sales hiring. Uh, since you've been part of uh, Mind Tickle now, uh, a boomerang. Uh, what are what are some of the must ask questions to ask in every sales hiring meeting, especially for founders and for VP sales roles? Yeah. So again, I've been part of sales hires. I've not necessarily been part of VP sales hiring process, so I can speak to more on the first part. Uh, I think the first set of sales hires again it, it it's really dependent on again if you are in a category creator or a category disruptor uh, and what you are looking for is someone who, who can uh, someone who is not your traditional salesperson a traditional salesperson is looking for that playbook yeah uh, they function really well in a system uh, you are looking for someone who cannot function who can function without a system uh, so it's less about the knowledge of selling, uh, which is important, absolutely, right? But more about uh, their their curiosity and uh, their willingness to uh, learn and and think on the feet. And what you know, what I think we, you know, interestingly, when we were at uh, you know, Mindical, I think what at least I've learned is the first sales hire was someone who was uh, almost fifty years old, right? And it's not your typical modern salesperson, but then she did exceptionally well uh, in the journey from zero to one. So again, it's not a question of age. Uh, yeah. Again, what you're looking for is, are they curious? Uh, uh, do they really understand the context that they're signing up for, uh, that they don't have a playbook, but you have a, uh, do, are they excited about, you know, the lack of a playbook? Are they excited about coming to a system which is being built as you're moving from uh, A to B? So that's what you're looking for. Uh, I think how they react to conversations, how they react to transparency, what kind of questions they ask uh, and how curious they are about learning about you ultimately matters more than uh, anything else. Uh, every other skill set you can find out more e in, in sales, things are black and white, right? Uh, it's yeah. much more easy to find. But I think how they approach you know, working for early stage startup is what I think is where you should spend a lot of time. A wrong sales hire can set you back uh, a long a, a long way, right? And uh, and again, hiring salespeople too early also can set you back a long way. Uh, again, in our own journey at Virus, uh, we had hired salespeople, good salespeople, right? And but we didn't have product market fit. Mm -hmm. So no matter what amount of effort they would put in, uh, they weren't able to be successful. So and but then because we hired those salespeople, we had to give it enough time to get the data to say that this is not working, right? And even though deep down we knew that something about this is broken. So again, uh, looking looking at the right profile, you know, in, in the, after the pivot, we are looking at the sales hiring very differently. We're not even looking for the traditional sales hire, looking for someone who's just like on marketing, we say growth hacker, they cannot other than sales, right? So again, figure out your, what you're looking for. And again, figure out someone who is super flexible in terms of what needs to be done. Quite interesting. Um, so, you know, I've been part of early stage startups. I've been fortunate enough to work very closely with the founders. But, um, you know, how would you judge curiosity? Because when you're interviewing somebody, you spend anywhere from two to three hours. But how can you judge uh, that the person with the right fit for you in such a crucial role? Um, and they're going to spend, you know, a couple of, couple of years uh, with you any questions which or any any uh, advice would you give to founders who are looking for that sort of curiosity for for a you know for a sales hire yeah yeah not a straightforward answer uh, rohit i think at least the way uh, i am looking at this uh, is that you are you want to put a situation in front of them and see how they respond, right? And as an example of that is uh, take your most recent uh, customer call recording, play it to them and see what they say. Do they ask questions? Uh, are they just saying, hey, great call, what's next step, right? Uh, that means certain something, right? Are they saying, what happens? Why did you say this? 
uh, why did the customer uh, ask this question, right? Why did they get excited about this feature? Uh, how they react to things that you present in front of them, uh, you know, can demonstrate a lot of how they how curious they are. Uh, similarly, when you put up a job description in front of them, right? Do they have questions about the role? Are they curious about what is success for them, right? And again, if they come and ask you, what's my quota? What's my plan? What's my ramp period? Uh, you know that you know, nothing wrong about them, but then you're not ready for them, right? You you cannot, uh, there's not an easy way for you to make them successful because you, right now your company has a quota, right? Not the individuals don't have a quota, right? So, and the job of, that first sales hire is to get you to scale a product market fit. Like you as a founder have got the first set of customers, you trying to replace yourself with someone and that person can now demonstrate to you mathematically that you know you are not needed to run a sales cycle and someone else can actually take this pain point, take the product, take the, uh, take the solution and, and actually make it, make it happen. So again, that's at least some of the excess that I've done uh, to learn. It's not foolproof. Uh, again, right? But then you have to look for it, right? Uh, in order to validate or invalidate, uh, if someone is curious. Got it. And and what are, what are some of your biggest lessons when it comes to navigating compensation discussions with potential sales hires, especially you know uh, if somebody who's like fifty years old or somebody who's really senior and uh, and being hired for a sales sales role. Uh, and uh, and they're looking for equity and for cash compensation. How how would you advise a founder on how to navigate such compensation discussions? Yeah, again, uh, it goes back to you know, are you ready to hire a, a, a proper salesperson? If you are ready to hire a proper salesperson, you need to be able to afford it. Right. Uh, most compensation for sales people are well defined uh, obviously you you don't you as a company aren't ready to pay them uh, in a certain way uh, because you cannot give them a quota as clearly as you would right but then uh, w i think if you are hiring your first 3 4 5 sales people you still have to give them a quota and you still have to uh, make sure that you're setting up setting them up to get to that quota right so when it comes to compensation it is still you have to go follow the industry but then uh, the reason they are coming to you is not just you know the salary and the quota and the commission they're coming to you for the bet right and and i think generally you know if you're able to give them the right equity package right the ESA package that's also a great lure uh, with sales again i would not try to save money it's not a it's not a role where you know you want to underpay them but but then you know pay bulk of it in commissions, right? Incentivize them with the right activities, right? And 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 again, early on, because you want them to do a lot of things, not every dollar that you pay out to them needs to be for, uh, you know, uh, deal ones. If you're very early in the sales cycle, very early in your maturity cycle, a lot of them could be number of conversations, number of closures, obviously is important, right? So figure out what you need to achieve over the next six, 12 months, uh, align, the uh, the composition structure around that and so that they know that hey you have a plan uh you know and the composition plan is aligned to that plan but again be generous uh you know if you are in sales uh, uh if someone is in sales they want to make money right so they're right. not in sales by by force they're in sales because they want to make money yeah. uh so give them that uh got, got it and yeah. and what's been your your lesson on uh you know what title negotiation uh you know says about a candidate and who sh do you think a vp sales role should be given very early uh yeah in in the in the startup journey i mean unless you're hiring for a co-founder if someone is asking a vp title uh, you're either you're not ready for them or you run away from them one of the two right and again you do need a vp at some point and again that point is a lot about you know you're almost at one right and you want to go, you know get to the next stage and get ready for the next stage uh, but if someone is saying i want to be a vp and uh, that means the objectives and the outcomes are not aligned yeah uh, and you need to 
pretty much think seriously about is this the right person uh, even co-founders you know at least i look at i i i spend 8 hours a day being a sales person yeah. uh, and when i when my other co-founder and in fact i have someone on my ops team when they do deal reviews they look at me as a rep that's by choice i think and the same set of medic uh, the same set of qualification frameworks right uh, accountability do the these activities on the next call right are done to me as well uh, and that is how you should I mean, at least that's our, that's worked well for us and if someone is coming in for a title maybe just not the right objective and outcomes alignment got got it and uh, in, in the last couple of years you know what or oh, what what in your view is the single biggest mistake you know founders make when they're looking to hire somebody for the sales team yeah early on in the journey hiring too early is a single is a mistake that we made okay uh, uh timing it right is important uh if you hire too early then you're stuck with that setup for a for at least a few more quarters Uh, if you hire too late, then you are losing critical, you know, you know, you know, timeline to get to PM up and get to the next round. If you venture back, yeah. uh, so when to hire is again, it's more art than science, more gut than data. Uh, and obviously, whom are you hiring for? Again, don't be vague. You're not hiring someone because you like them. You should have a point of view on on what you want, to, what you're looking for. Uh, and that should not change uh, right it can evolve but cannot change uh, through the process so at least, those are two mistakes that we made and i think again at least as we went as we go through the pivot uh, we don't want to repeat that right we don't want to hire too early right and uh, first time when we started viruses uh, i wanted to be the co-founder and cro right and then uh, then i would i then we'll go hire sales people to do the work and i'll be the manager Uh, at least in retrospect the learning is you are a sales person to get the first 25 30 customers yeah. right and you need to act like one right and and obviously you have the advantage of being the founder which means you can talk about the vision you can talk about the future get the market excited but then you are to still do the job right uh, so don't just because you're a founder it doesn't it should not i mean it got to my head in some ways if i have to be fully honest uh, so again when i look for Who am I? Who am I hiring? It's the same grounded person, right? They're not coming in here uh, to be a VP. They're coming in here for the ride early on, uh, and the upside is quite high, but nothing is guaranteed, right? Like chances of success are still very low early on uh, in, in the company journey. Got it. And and how do you approach discounting? Uh, and and you know when when do you think is the right time to do it? Yeah, so uh, I think we uh, so in the pivot we are in a more established market. So I think recruiting the first set of customers, uh, uh, early customer discount has played a big role in uh, in obviously driving people to coming to us. But once you get to a more later stage, again, if I go back to my uh, career as salesperson at Mindtickle, uh, at that time a lot of discounting has to be used very really strategically, uh, and uh, and And, and you you are part of a setup, right? Like the salesperson does not have the right to give discounts beyond what standard, right? And being able to use use as a leverage in negotiations uh, can have a huge impact in controlling the sales cycle, uh, getting a much longer term, uh, you know. And again, term, price, and timing, right, are the three three variables. Uh, and how well you interplay them into your packaging and discounting conversations, I think, can play a big role. Uh, like we've, I've had back in the day when I was selling uh, situations where uh, the market was great, uh, we were we were doing really well, and we were able to get you know six six figure sound sound figure in fact sound figure deals uh, in a couple of quarters by the right discounting strategy, right? Because we were able to create that artificial sense of uh timing uh but again i think again something that you worry about at much a later stage in your journey uh early on you know when you, when you are a founder you you obviously have a lot more leverage right and again but at the same time you don't need to 
lose your leverage by giving discounts more openly. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Got it. Makes sense. And 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 how do how do you how do you structure deal reviews? Um, you know what is what is a good versus bad reason to to lose a deal? Yeah. So uh, we, because we come from like two of the three founders, we come from uh, you know, sales background. Right. Uh, we've uh, we've done from very early days a very clear point of view on medic and uh, sales stages. And uh, having your sales stages, even if when you don't have a lot of customers, having your sales stages, entry exit criteria, uh, and medic defined and holding yourself accountable to that uh, becomes uh, critical in terms of how we do it. Like we do it weekly uh, before, uh, before, and this is like even at this stage, every Friday evening, we sit down and look at the deals. Uh, we look at the coverage. We look at... Uh, if something is slipping, why is it slipping? Early on, a lot of deals are going to slip at this stage. But then the learning is the bigger driver. And again, not uh, making that mistake again is something that you want to make sure you're doing. Uh, so deal reviews are a lot, lot about coverage, going to specific deals, looking at medic, looking at the mutual action plan, and making sure that you know, there's a clear set of actions to be done before uh, for the deal to come in a predictable timeline. Right? So... Early on, if you're able to do that, you work like a professional sales organization. And it 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 makes you look, it makes us look a lot more professional in front of our customers. Uh, our emails are more thorough, uh, right? The follow-ups clearly list down what needs to be done, who does what. Uh, uh, the, the buyers look at us with a sense of purpose, right? And, uh, and again, it drives more confidence. We're not just a product company, we're a business company. Right. So deal reviews becomes more important because it's someone else holding you accountable. Yeah. Uh, and on set of activities. Got it. And and how do you approach multi-year deals? You know, um, what what is what is good and bad when you look when you're trying to review multi-year uh, deals with a client? Yeah, I mean, again, multi-year. At least again, it, it really depends on what kind of product you are selling and yeah. what is your uh, uh, what is the time to value and what kind of market you are selling in uh, obviously if you get multi year deals nothing it, it's great yeah uh, it it is takes time to figure out uh, what what does it take to get multi year deals uh, you are unlikely to get unlikely to get multi year deals if you are a tool uh, you need to get to a, being a platform because that is when they, it's a serious investment. Tools are replaceable, platforms aren't. Uh, and uh, and again, multi-year deals are more common in the enterprise than mid-market and SMB. Right. Uh, right? So at least for us, again, in our journey, we're trying to figure out how do we go up-market, right? Again, how do we get to the point where, you know, we are not selling every 12 months. Uh, we are being a more strategic partner uh, to the customer. And again, can you really be a strategic partner to the customer? Uh, can you go sell to a CXO? Uh, can you uh, articulate the impact of what you create you know, in a very direct manner uh, that a CXO cares about? Some of, if you have answered some of these questions, you are set up for having multi-year deals. Then it's a lot about packaging, having the platform story, having the product roadmap, Right, uh, a lot of them needs to fall in place. Correct, and uh, you know, buyer assist, and you know, boom, um, be part of the seventh cohort of Sequoia Search. Um, what's been your experience, you know, working with with uh, with the Sequoia Sik- uh, Search, and you know, any any learnings you want to share with with the, uh, with the listeners? Yeah, I mean, uh, Surge has been an exceptional program for us. Uh, it gave us the ability to benchmark ourselves against some of the best startups coming out of India sure. uh, and also create a healthy group of people that can talk to each other about problems that are common and uh, and uh, and obviously help each other out right so but then going to surge it gives us you know gave us a mirror view into uh, you know what we are doing wrong and what where we can do better, where we can be better. Uh, we came across several other 
super smart super hungry entrepreneurs uh who were very similar to us uh, very much better than us and very similar to us in terms of journey right like they quit super fancy jobs uh and you know pretty much took you know bet on themselves uh but then it gave us visibility into group of people uh and working with them i think was was really good the program itself also was uh, you know structured quite well i think it it took us through uh, you know the design principles around building a startup uh ev- from everything around how do you think about product how do you think about engineering how do you think about culture how do you think about sales uh they they divided the program into multiple such topics and multiple sessions uh but then again that was you can find a lot of that content online but then when you combine that with people who are going through a journey in a similar way and put them in a room for several weeks together i think that program had worked out quite well for us it, that program also was a big reason that you know we accelerated our way of executing uh it also got us to the decision to pivot much faster uh because again it helps it helps with benchmarking it helps helps with uh yeah making sure that we are holding ourselves to a higher standard got it and i'm going to quickly want to do the top three what's your favorite business book uh i keep going back to crossing the chasm uh, uh you know yeah that's that's my favorite book yeah Correct. Uh, you know, it's 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 a great book. Uh, we'll put that in show notes. And you know, if you could go back in time when you started being uh, uh buyer assist and then then you pivoted to boom boom rank, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done done anything differently? Yeah. Uh, I think the one thing I would be very focused on is obsess over product market fit. Uh, over. everything else uh, i mean typically when you're a founder you typically done something you know you accomplish something before you start a company uh, you come with a lot of confidence and it i think again i think if i were to do this again i would be more grounded focus on product market fit and uh, everything else can happen later hiring people scaling system scaling process like everything can can happen later uh, that's one thing i would absolutely change uh, if i were to go back in time correct and and you have any favorite online tools example gmail slack zoom i mean I, i'm in the world of sales uh, so linkedin is my favorite uh, tool i i spend more time on linkedin than anything else yeah no absolutely same same for me um we'll put that in the show notes and um and shankar what, what is the best way people can know more about you and boomerang Uh, okay, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, what's the best way people can know more about you and Boomerang? Absolutely, yeah. Take a look at our website. It's called getboomerang.ai, uh, and uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn. My name Shankar Ganapati. You search that. I think there are a handful of people, uh, but easy to spot me on LinkedIn, right? Yeah, you can learn about uh, obviously what what we do and what I do uh, in these places. No, absolutely we'll put down in the show notes uh, shankar thank you so much for taking our time speaking to us i really enjoyed my conversation with you oh, thank you uh, glad we could uh, do this and really enjoy the conversation